industry that is that are not considered essential at this time, everyone is affected. So one of the things that I recognized uh, that is so important for us to always remember uh, is to be kind. Be kind to those who you see. A simple smile or a wave or a kind word can really uplift someone who's dealing uh, with depression, anxiety, uh, or concern about themselves, their family members, their jobs. We must be kind to each other. Uh, during this time in particular, it's important for us to be generous. If we know of families or individuals who need financial assistance and we have the ability to give, let's give. This is the time for us to step up and show who we really are as people and as a community. And I have been so impressed uh, by what I've seen so far um, in terms of folks in the community really lending a helping hand, uh, but we need to do more of that. And while you know we know that until May 1st, uh, at least at this time, uh, our way of life has changed, it may be longer, it's possible. And so we need to dig even deeper, those of us who have the ability uh, to give to those who are suffering at this time. So I just want us uh, as a community to recognize all the great works we have done so far, but that more is going to be asked of us, and especially those who have the ability and the means to provide for others at this time. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to start with that because that's what this is really about. This community in the courthouse has always been about bridging the community with government. And in our case, it is the criminal justice system. So right now, as you probably know, the operations at the courthouse uh, have really significantly been reduced. Uh, we're not having trials, whether it's criminal or civil. And so there are no juries. So if you've got a jury duty notice, um, you'll probably get another one in the future, but there are no uh, juries uh, being impaneled at this time. The grand jury, uh, which indicts cases for our office are not impaneled at this time. And so there's gonna be a lot of work to do once we get through this pandemic, uh, because we'll have a lot of those trials set in and, uh, you know, again, both criminal and civil, obviously we deal with the criminal trials, um, but everything has been delayed. Every statute, applicable statute has been told. And so, um, you know, if there are no deadlines right now in order to try cases or to handle civil matters, everything has been extended. So, um, you know, that is good, but it's also not so great for those who, who are impacted in the criminal justice system, because that means potentially that they have to wait longer uh, for justice, or they have to wait longer to have their day in court. Um, and so that can be very stressful. Um, and, you know, we understand that. Uh, so one of the things that we're doing at this time, because bond hearings are still going on, so there are emergency hearings that are still happening in our courthouse. Uh, well, actually, it's all happening virtually right now, but it's happening within our criminal justice system. So what you'll, you'll probably, uh, you've probably heard on the news that, uh, that Prince George's County really was the first county uh, to step out and say, we're going to do our part uh, to reduce uh, the jail population because we know that the jails uh, can be a breeding ground for any type of illness or virus and certainly coronavirus because it spread so quickly um, that we knew that there was potential there and so we started um, a, a operation safe release program uh, looking at uh, you know low level uh, offenders who we don't believe uh, will pose a threat to our communities. And my chief of staff, Judy Danso, will update you on uh, that uh, program, but uh, I can tell you it's going quite well. And others around the state have, uh, you know, followed our lead and have um, started their own programs. Um, so we're still handling um, bond hearings, though we're doing it virtually. Um, we also uh, participate in what's called problem solving courts. So we still have individuals 
who uh, need assistance through our courts, whether it's veterans court, drug court, mental health court. We don't want folks who have special needs to slip through the cracks at this time. So we still are holding those hearings and connecting those individuals with the services they need. Uh, and uh, we are also participating in our juvenile detention hearings. Young people in our criminal justice system, again, very vulnerable population, and we wanna make sure that we're doing everything that we can uh, to connect them back with their families, if that's the appropriate thing, or place them in the appropriate care setting. Uh, again, to reduce their exposure uh, to the virus. So uh, we're still working very, very hard every single day uh, for you. In addition to that, you'll hear from our victim witness coordinator, and you'll also hear uh, from the executive director of the Family Justice Center, Denise uh, McCain, who will talk to you about the services that we are providing to victims, in particular, victims of domestic violence and child abuse, uh, because we understand that uh, that victims of domestic violence and victims of child abuse are even more vulnerable at times when, when we're facing a crisis. And so um, we are working very hard to get out the message that we are still 24-7 uh, providing services for our victims. So you'll hear from them later too. Um, but again, we are still working, um, even though um, most of my staff is working from home. Uh, we have trainings at least two times a week for our staff. And it's been a great way to bring everyone together, though virtually, but also ensure that we are doing our, our part to uh, continue to improve our skill sets and our service to you. So I just wanna let you know that we, are con we continue to be committed uh, to justice in our community. Uh, I continue to be committed to my staff and um, though most of us are telecommuting, I do have staff members that have to enter the courthouse uh, to perform an essential service uh, for our office. Um, yesterday, I picked up um, masks for them. Uh, they will be distributed over the next uh, few days. Uh, I, I care about my staff. I care about their health, their well-being. Uh, they have jobs to do and, and they are sacrificing to do those jobs, uh, but we all have to do our part to make sure that those who are sacrificing for us uh, have uh, the supplies and equipment they need to keep themselves as safe as possible. So to my staff who has to go to work, uh, who has to enter the courthouse uh, a few times a week, uh, let, I want to let you know that my, my thoughts and my prayers are with you. If you ever need anything, please let me know. Um, but that, that's true for the entire community because there are people in the community that have to go to work every single day who didn't know they were first responders until this event happened. Uh, we understand that our police, our fire, our law enforcement uh, officials, they understand that their first responders are hospitals, our healthcare workers, uh, but those who, who didn't re recognize how vital and important they were, uh, maybe to, to all of our way of life, our grocery store workers, our truckers, uh, those who have to go to work because they are providing uh, essential goods that we need in order to stay, stay healthy. I wanna thank all of you who are sacrificing and going to work and doing your jobs and putting yourself potentially in harm's way uh, uh, for our community. I really appreciate all of you. Um, so I look forward to all of the presentations today, and I also look forward to your questions. And I will turn it over, I guess, uh, to my chief of staff, I think is going next, uh, Judy Banta. Good morning, and thank you, Madam State's Attorney. I wanna make sure that my sound is on and that I can be heard. Can everyone hear? Yes, I can hear okay. you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, again, good morning. I, I first do uh, want to also just take this brief opportunity just to wish everyone um, extreme health and safety uh, during this most surreal time. I uh, certainly share um, the state's attorney's sentiments um, to, you know, extend my sincerest condolences to any of those who have personally felt the effects of this ravaging uh, COVID-19 disease. I mean, it is just really unpredictable and unprecedented times. 
Um, and I, you know, I just hope that only that we can only continue to pray to navigate um, these trying times in spirit and in, 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 in faith and with the level of togetherness um, for what the state's attorney has deemed are indeed uh, better days ahead. And so with that, um, I'll just kind of get into uh, the slide presentation. Imani, if we can go to the next slide. So as many of you are already aware, uh, one of the most heavily discussed topics um, really on both the national and local fronts uh, within this COVID-19 public health pandemic has been what the state's attorney has already kind of alluded to, our depopulation of our jails across the country. Um, and this, of course, is a specific concern to public safety. Uh, we knew that the COVID-19 uh, public health emergency created an immediate national threat to the criminal justice system. Um, and as a result, you know, there was a likely and imminent danger uh, that, this le that the lethality of this disease um, would, you know, undoubtedly pose on our jail population. And so of immediate concerns for us were, you know, the overcrowding of our jails, um, the, unsan the unsanitary conditions, certainly the jail cell compositions. Oftentimes there are more than one um, defendants or inmates um, to a cell. Um, and I think just also just the real realities of uh, the inability to socially distance. Um, and of course, you know, a primary concern for us is the health, safety, and welfare of our detention center staff and their families. Um, and of course, you know, these inmates that are being held pretrial as well. Um, because while yes, you know, we, we know that they're accused of having committed crimes and violations of the law, um, they are also individuals who don't necessarily deserve to be uh, treated inhumanely. Um, now, of course, you know, in my opinion, some defendants certainly don't deserve <laughs> even the slightest consideration. Um, but to the extent that we can make those assessments, we do. And so um, from the perspective of public safety, we knew that, you know, there was this pervasive threat of harm and that the virus could potentially become widespread within our jail facility as the state's attorney has already um, spoken to. Um, and so by way of background, early on, we thought that uh, reducing the jail population was the responsible thing to do. Um, and because this was sort of the predetermined mindset of our office, um, we didn't need for anyone to tell us that it was the right thing to do. We just acted quickly to ensure that um, you know, we could address this issue. Um, and so the state's attorney did her on view assessment of uh, the critical areas of public safety that our office could take initiative on um, to assist with preventing what we knew would ultimately be a viral spread of the coronavirus. And of course, you know, without question, we determined that, you know, this depopulation effort um, was a high priority for the agency. Because for us, you know, we had always said from the beginning that it was not a matter of if, um, but certainly when. And I, and I just really want to tip my hat off to her because she really was uh, the first in the state and arguably across, you know, the country <laughs> um, to, you know, really lead these efforts. And I know she oftentimes credits uh, our DOC director, Mary Lou McDonough, for sort of first founding uh, the alarm on this problematic issue. And, and again, we are definitely grateful to work alongside her and her amazing team daily. Um, but, you know, the state's attorney just really did proactively champion this cause. Um, and I'd also be remiss if I, you know, did not also openly acknowledge our um, district public defender, Keith Lotridge, and his leadership team, because uh, we kind of started out this whole uh, quote unquote operation um, as a joint effort. And so we, we started out kind of collaboratively identifying those several cases where we agreed a pretrial release recommendation um, on either an unsecured bond or per personal recognizance was appropriate. Um, and so with this uh, national and local call to action to combat the virus and prevent the further spread, um, these were you know, the efforts that we certainly took on because it was just about understanding, um, again, these unprecedented and unpredictable times. Um, but again, 
with the state's attorney's directive for us to just really think quickly about how we continue to maintain um, our priority to public safety. And of course, in this instance, a substantial, um, you know, the, the public health aspect was a substantial factor. I'd also note that um, when we started out just about three weeks ago, there were not any confirmed cases in the jail. Today, we have 10. Um, so again, it was just not a matter of if, but when. Amani, we can go to the next slide. And so I've already sort of touched on the purpose and goal of our safe release program. Um, we, you know, we realized that the focus had to be on the safe and responsible release of low level inmates, um, protecting the public health and safety of the community, uh, protecting the public health and safety of our correction staff and their families, um, establishing a coordinated response with our justice partners to control adult popul uh, I'm sorry, the adult daily population numbers, um, which you know, would ultimately provide the additional quarantine spacing as necessary. Um, I believe that there are some portions of the jail that aren't being utilized, uh, and for good reason, um, but of course, any additional space that, you know, depopulation could potentially yield is tremendously helpful to the facility. Next slide, please. And so I sort of already kind of <laughs> jumped the gun in uh, highlighting a few of our justice partners who aligned with us around these efforts, but I do not want to leave out any of those that I've listed here because again, uh, we are all in this together. Um, and the reality is just that this type of undertaking is impossible to accomplish without partners um, and justice partners such as these on board. Um, and so I, I did definitely um, acknowledge our uh, public defender's office, our entire DOC, who we literally communicate with several times a day on end, um, certainly our, uh, our judiciary and the accommodations that have been made um, for our office under the direction of Judge Lisa Hall Johnson, um, our county's Department of Health, and of course, our amazing public safety partners, the um, county's police department, and of course, our office of the sheriff. Again, I, I just can't emphasize how grateful we are to have worked with such amazing partners um, on this effort. Next slide, please. Okay, so in an effort to safely and um, responsibly release defendants held pretrial, um, we sort of adopted this uh, plan of action. Um, in reviewing the weekly reports that were requested from DOC, we would readily identify those inmates held on the more low level offenses, um, conduct any you know, necessary records checks as to that defendant's criminal history, um, any history of failing to appear before the court, um, parole or probation statuses, any pending or open cases, et cetera, et cetera, as a part of you know, our, our initial assessment. Um, and these assessments were done on you know, every case, on a case-by-case -case basis, um, because this was the information that we use and is the information that we use um, when making uh, specific recommendations, whether at the initial appearance phase before a commissioner or during a bail bond review hearing before a judge. And of course, documenting outcomes. I um, note on a daily basis in a sort of comprehensive spreadsheet um, that I'll show some screenshots of shortly uh, what our respective outcomes on each of these bond hearings were. Next slide. Okay. I do find it important for our community to just be educated on some of the governing rules of law that we use as our backdrop for bail review and bond hearings. I know that, you know, oftentimes we use a lot of unfamiliar terms. Um, so I think it's just important to put things into perspective and into layman terms. Um, Maryland rule 4-216 is the rule that provides both um, authority and guidance to uh, judges and commissioners as judicial officers with respect to pretrial release of arrested individuals. And of course, the Court of Appeals uh, adopted 4-216.1 
as a way to encourage the release of more defendants on personal recognizance and um, unsecured bonds. And so I'll just quickly note that uh, this particular rule also instructs judges to, you know, sort of perform some individual assessments for each defendant's ability to pay um, a bail. Um, and of course, um, where appropriate, impose those least restrictive or um, burdensome conditions for release while certainly still ensuring that that defendant will appear in court um, and, and that we're protecting the safety of um, alleged victims and the community. I think we can certainly thank our good Attorney General Frosch for this. Um, but what I will say is that, you know, the resulting impact of not doing this assessment is one of the reasons why under our administration, uh, we established a bond policy where we no longer make monetary recommendation as it relates to bail. And while, you know, we have uh, sort of relaxed our bond policy a bit in light of the COVID-19 crisis, we still do not make cash bail recommendations before any judicial officer. And so I just wanted to make sure that we pointed that out. And so, Iman, we can go to the next slide. And you'll see in the next slide um, where we can, you know, one, assure a defendant's appearance at future court dates, and two, um, his or her dangerousness to, um, or, you know, do our assessments as to his or her dangerousness to any victim, witness, and the community as a whole. Um, these are hugely uh, significant consideration factors when making pretrial release recommendations. And of course, that's in addition to the seriousness of the offense, the nature of the evidence against that defendant, along with the several other factors that are listed uh, there on this slide. Uh, I simply highlighted the state's recommendation factor because we do realize you know, the power of our office's recommendation at the pretrial release phase. And so during this crisis, this crisis of a pandemic, um, where we can use our power and discretion to, again, do the right thing, that's what we are doing and that's what we will continue to do. Uh, next slide. Okay, I think you can go to the next slide. Next slide. That's just kind of all of the consideration factors. Okay, great. So here are just a, you know some of the visual aids that I that I use um, for you know our community to understand how we capture the information. Um, this is a comprehensive uh, spreadsheet that details uh, the hearing outcomes on those cases that are heard for purposes of bail review. Um, as you can see, I make daily attempts to um, capture all of the relevant case information. Um, the, the bond status, the state's position, uh, you know, which ASA is in the courtroom, or which judge is also hearing um, these cases, and uh, the various determinations. And you'll see, you know, the designations uh, for whether that individual was held without bond, uh, ordered pretrial release, um, a monetary bond set by a judge, uh, an unsecured bond set, or that defendant released um, on their own personal recognizance. And any applicable notes are also captured there as well. So this is kind of like our internal guide that we use um, to detail the outcomes on all of our bill and bond hearings. Next slide. We also do maintain a, a, a separate uh, uh, internal spreadsheet. I'll just point that out for our initial appearances. Um, as those do not have pretrial or, or do not have release options through pretrial services available during that stage. Um, however, as the state's attorney noted, we do still participate regularly in those hearings and make the appropriate recommendations for either the defendant to be released on their own um, recognizance or held without bond. And so I, I try as much as possible to capture all of this data because we know that data is not just useful for the now, um, but certainly can be in the future uh, as well for a number of reasons. And so this slide was just really intended to illustrate the running daily totals uh, that we maintain and report to the state's attorney on a daily basis. And you can see that those numbers are highlighted in blue with the totals off to the right. Next slide. Okay. Victim impact. Um, and, and of course, you will hear from our amazing chief, um, 
Teresa Middleton, chief of our victim witness unit, as she will speak um, directly to some of our um, services and, and, and support during this time. Um, but as I mentioned, our goal is to focus on those low level offenders. Um, however, some of these cases um, do involve victims. And so in those instances where uh, the potential safety of a victim is a known factor, um, but nevertheless, a judge or commissioner has found you know, that defendant eligible for release, we do coordinate um, directly with DOC to ensure that the victim is contacted. Additionally, um, we will make you know, specific recommendations on the record related to no contact of that person. And so we, we understand the necessity of our efforts during this time, um, but the safety and support of victims are always a top priority for our office. Next slide. So just in terms of actual numbers, um, over this three week period um, of Operation Safe Release, we began, well, yeah, we, we began, I think it was March 19th. Yes, that was the date, it is there on the screen. Um, and, and that's really in terms of the actual activity in the courtroom. Certainly our assessment um, began much earlier, but the adult daily population census at that time was 706. As of yesterday, we got confirmation that the ADP number was 597. So we can say with, you know, with confidence that we have um, certainly directly contributed and impacted the detention center's census uh, with our individual and collective depopulation efforts. And so I'll just sort of end with noting, um, you know, that these efforts remain ongoing every day that the court is holding bond hearings although we have uh, resorted to remote operations at this time um, at both the district and circuit court levels. And the other phase of the operation safe release uh, kind of relates to the sentence population of defendants. Um, you know, our proactive steps to reduce population extend to all facilities where we have, you know, some sort of influence. And what I've spoken to um, this morning in large part involves um, individually and individually reviewing the cases of defendants accused of a crime but awaiting trial. Um, but the other phase, which I sort of refer to as phase two of our Operation Safe Release, um, is headed by our Conviction and Sentencing Integrity Unit that is led by our Chief of Operations, Doyle Neiman. And so they've also been reviewing those cases of um, defendants who have been sentenced to a term of, of incarceration in the county jail. Um, and so again, you know, where we thought uh, public safety was not, you know, in danger or at risk, um, or even in some of those cases where uh, there may be significant underlying health concerns of that defendant, um, we have worked to release individuals, although, you know, the final decision certainly lies with the courts. Um, and so I'll just really end by acknowledging a few folks from our office who were just absolutely essential to these release efforts and assisted or contributed in some capacity. Certainly Ms. Alvita Martin, who is who we regard as, you know, the irreplaceable um, Alvita Martin. She's our resident agent and, and senior ASA expert in the courtroom when these bond hearings are heard daily. Um, senior ASA uh, Todd Stewart, who I regard as our secondary resident agent. <laughs> Um, and really has taken on the task of, of ensuring that, um, you know, he assists however possible with the continuity of operations in um, 261. Uh, I, I do want to acknowledge Connie, who was one of our legal assistants who did just an amazing job um, with assisting me on um, the necessary records checks on a significant number of the cases when we first started out. Um, Rebecca, who was one of our superstar victim witness coordinators, and of course, other members in leadership. Uh, Perry Paler, our Chief of Guns and Drugs, uh, our Special Counsel, Ger Gerald Collins, and of course, our Principal Deputy, Jason Abbott. Um, and so I just want to thank, you know, each of you for listening in and participating in our uh, virtual community in the courthouse this morning. And again, um, certainly do wish everyone um, good health and certainly safety during this time. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to our amazing Chief of our victim witness unit, who I have the pleasure of working with directly, um, who will, I guess, uh, certainly briefly inform all of you on steps that our office has taken during this time to keep the lines of communication open um, as it relates to our victims and witnesses. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, my name is Teresa Middleton, and as it has been said previously, I am the chief of our victim witness unit um, in the state's attorney's office. And um, as you know, um, after the order had come down um, from our Chief Judge Barbera regarding, you know, restricting the operations of our circuit and district courts, um, that we needed to make sure that we still had access um, with our victims and our witnesses and they were being taken care of. Um, next slide, please. Um, because of this COVID, um, you can go to the next slide, sorry. Um, because of these efforts and the effect that um, COVID-19 has had on the operations of our court, um, our state's attorney, um, Ms. Aisha Brayboy, um, we just want to acknowledge her and thank her for making sure that our citizens of Prince George's County was still being taken care of even during this time. Um, and because of that, um, you know, we realized that the impact has been on our district and our circuit court operations that this um, effect has had an effect on our victims and our witnesses in the assigned cases that we do on a daily basis. Um, we needed to make sure that we remained responsive to our victims and our witnesses need during this time um, because we wanted to make sure that they were updated on their cases and the available resources um, that was there and that could be there for her. And because of that, you know, our state's attorney wanted to make sure that we had um, different operations in place to take care of this matter. Um, the next slide. Um, so during this effort, um, we wanted to make sure that there were immediate responses to our victims. We wanted to make sure if there were a need, um, there were needs in our community, needs in regards to our cases um, and any resources that our victims or our witnesses might need at that time. Um, we wanted to make sure that they were being taken care of. So we do have um, a dedicated um, team of team leads, our specialists um, in our victim witness unit that are rotating in the office, even though um, we have a limited staff, um, our courts are closed to the public, we are still there making sure that our um, witnesses and victims are taken care of, whatever needs they have, that we take care of them. Um, we have a designated emergency telephone line for all emergencies, and you can see that number on the screen. Um, so that number goes directly to our victim witness unit for any needs, and that number is 24-7. So no matter what time there is a need, um, that number is always available. And we also um, have a specific email inbox for any victims or witness related um, inquiries at this time. That um, email address is being um, reviewed every day by our team leads in, in, within the office, even though we're vir virtual telemark um, working we are still checking that email. So if you have any concerns in reference to a case, if you have any concerns in reference to anything that is going on in our community, um, just send an email to that inbox and we will definitely um, get back with you. Um, our next slide. And during this um, pandemic of our COVID-19, we realize that we still need to um, reach out to partners um, within our community um, to make sure that there are resources for our victims and our witnesses during this time. Um, because we realize that um, not just one person is effect affected during this time, but we all are affected. And we want to make sure that even during this time that we're doing our part to help out um, in the community. Um, we commit continue to provide emergency housing um, and relocation for our and services to our victims during this time and also connect them with partners who can assist them with additional resources. Um, questions regarding domestic violence, um, we do have um, our special victims unit and they do have a direct um, email that you can also send um, questions to in regards to any domestic violence um, cases. Um, and also, if there's a situation that arises during this time, please call 911. 911 is still operating, dispatches are still operating. So if there's something that is an emergency, please still call our 911 agencies. During this time, um, 
Our child protective services are still operating, even though it's um, through our teleworking, but they are still answering the needs of our community. Um, our national domestic violence hotline is still operating. So during this time, even though we are not physically together, we are still operating and assisting our victims and our witnesses of the community. The Maryland Crime Victim Resource Center is still available um, to continue to serve our victims through this time, um, through, not just through Prince George's County, but they are there to assist throughout the state of Maryland um, with our legal services, um, consulting with our victims' rights, and then also connecting um, individuals with social service organizations. We also have, and which you will hear from her, um, our executive director of our Family Justice Center, Mr. Um, Denise McCain, as our state's attorney has already noted, um, she will also be um, explaining to you the services that are still being um, assisted with during this time, advocacy, emergency, and temporary shelter for our victims, supportive social services. We have a range of resources that we are still um, doing during this time. So we just want to make sure that the community knows that even though we are not physically in the office, we are still there to make sure your needs are met, to make sure that even though your trial may not be going right now, we are still there to update you on what is happening with your cases. We are still there to answer your calls um, no matter what time. Um, the next slide. And just to let you know that there are also still supportive services out there that are still operating, um, such as our Department of Health and Human Services, um, our Domestic Violence Safe Housing, um, Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Center that is there, still there to help you, our Family Crisis Center, our Community Advocates and Family and Youth, they are still there um, to assist um, if anybody needs counseling during this time please reach out to our other partners. Um, and as I stated before, our Maryland Crime Victim Resource Center and our Family Justice Center, we are still there um, assisting. No matter what the need is, um, please make sure you reach out to the state's attorney's office because we are here to assist um, in the community. Um, and we appreciate um, our state's attorney, Ms. Brayboy, allowing us this opportunity, even though the community in the courthouse, um, we can't be together physically. She has allowed us this opportunity to be virtual. So I just wanna let her know we appreciate her and thank her for all her efforts and what she's doing during this time and that we are still there to assist our victims and witnesses of Prince George's County. Thank you. Aww, thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Denise McCain from the Prince George's County Family Justice Center. Good morning, everyone. And again, I just like to say, uh, start out by saying to uh, Ms. Brayfoy, our state's attorney, thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in this uh, teleconference. And also just to say how important it is that we get information out to the community right now during this time of anxiety and stress, uh, information is key. So I do thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this. Uh, the Family Justice Center, as most of you know, is an initiative of the Circuit Court for Prince George's County. And as with all of the other offices and county agencies in the Prince George's County, uh, under the leadership of the Honorable Sheila Artilliston Adams, we also closed our doors physically on March 11th just to make sure that everyone was safe. However, we are continuing to provide services remotely. Uh, staff are still working and all services that were available when the doors were open are continued at this point in time. But as was stated, you know, we know that this is a very difficult time for everyone, but perhaps even more so for individuals who are dealing with domestic violence. And I just wanna talk a little bit about that of course, we know that we've all been asked to avoid going out in public spaces and working 
We're working remotely to help to try to produce this spread. But for many survivors, staying at home is not necessarily the safest option. Uh, the external factors, we know that people are losing their jobs right now. Uh, there are financial issues associated with that. Less out outlets uh, to relieve some of that stress is really creating a very high stress environment, which does have a negative impact on survivors. And it does create circumstances where they are not as safe. With that said, I want to make sure that it's clear that we have not at the Family Justice Center seen a significant increase to date of calls. What I'm suspecting, and I would proper to say that this is the quiet before the storm, and I would imagine that we will probably see a significant uptick in calls and demand for services afterwards. But many of you, I know the calls that we have received have been around court civil matters, protection orders, uh, final orders with dates. It's important to understand that protection orders, I believe Ms. Middleton said that, our public safety officials are still working. Commissioners are still working. You are still able to get a protection, protective order from the Hyattsville commissioner or the Upper Marlboro Jail. Those are the two locations right now where protective orders are being issued. If someone has a protective order that was scheduled to expire, those orders are now being extended at least until May 1st. Of course, that's contingent upon the court reopening. So there's no need to be concerned about the status of an order or whether or not you can get one. Safety is of the utmost importance. So if needed, please pursue a protective order. In addition to that, as was stated, we are working. We are providing all of the services that we were working on before. We're doing this through telework. We have five staff members to include intake specialists as well as a case manager. Our receptionist, all of the calls are being forwarded to a cell phone. Receptionist is answering the call and connecting individuals with the case manager and or intake specialists who are addressing the needs. We have 23 partners that are co-located on site that are not there now. They're also teleworking, but we are connecting clients with those resources in a very timely and efficient manner. So if someone is needing assistance with a legal matter, uh, pending cases that just have questions, the attorneys are available. What we're finding, most of our calls are coming in for counseling. As I said, people are stressed. There are a lot, there's a lot of anxiety. They need to have coping skills. How do I get through this time period? Our counselor is also available, the therapist that we're working with, who's doing telehealth sessions. Some are also being done via Skype. We have social welfare needs. We have individuals who need assistance with cash, food stamps, housing vouchers. All of those things are still being done through the Family Justice Center with the help of our partners. That again, I'd like to just point out is the value of the Family Justice Center and the reason why this facility was even open. We are making this process much more efficient. And at a time like this, no one wants to make five, six, seven, eight calls to get help. Calling the Family Justice Center, that one number, that one-stop shop will enable you to get all of the help you need. The resources are there. Finally, I'd just like to mention very quickly, again, talking about safety. When you call and if you need it, we will do individual safety plans for each person because they're gonna look different for everyone. But during COVID-19, a safety plan may look very different than what it looked like prior to this crisis. There are a few extra measures that we actually want you to consider. And that's largely because this crisis and the, the, the virus itself is even being used as a tool. As we all know, abuse is about power and control. And survivors have to take control of their lives during this time, and especially being mindful of staying safe. What I would encourage you to do without going through a long list of these items is to call one of our intake specialists at our main number, which is 301-780-8008 and get an individualized safety plan. Understand that you still have options to leave. As was stated, we are working directly with what's now called Community Crisis Inc., which was the Family uh, Crisis Center. We're working directly with them to help facilitate shelter. 
Uh, they are open, they do have space, they are mindful of COVID-19 requirements, sanitizing, keeping people at safe distances. So shelter is an option if necessary, but recognize that your two options are to stay or to go. If you have to go, that option is there, but please be mindful that you may have to go, the, the options may be fewer. You may not be able to shelter in place with a family member or friend. You may have to go to a shelter. In addition, if you're there, stay connected with family and friends. We should all be doing social welfare checks right now, no matter what the circumstances may be. But for persons who are involved in domestic violence situations, it's extremely important to make sure that a family member, a trusted friend, someone knows what's going on. You develop a code word, have them call you routinely, once a day, ideally at the same time each day. If you don't answer the phone, that's an indication that you need help. So please be very strategic, be proactive, but get help, call 911, whatever you need. Don't let this pandemic hold you in fear. We have to react and we wanna make sure that you're safe. Call the Family Justice Center, we're there to help you. Again, that number is 301-780-8008. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Denise Smith. I am the Communications Director in the State's Attorney's Office, and um, we do have a few questions um, from some of the attendees. Um, if you um, do still have a question, um, you can type it at the bottom of uh, the screen in the Q&A box, and um, I'm gonna uh, read the first question right now. So the first question says, uh, what are we, doing about elections, are they being pushed back or recommended to be pushed back due to the lack of capability of proper campaigning? Well, I believe that the governor um, postponed elections, I believe until um, June 2nd already. Um, how the elections will be conducted, um, that I think is going to be driven really by the Maryland State Board of Elections and their recommendations to the governor. So I can't uh, answer that question, um, but we can uh, try to get information uh, from the Maryland State Board of Elections uh, so that we can respond to that. So um, when we send out our updates um, to all of the participants here, we will make sure that we include that uh, question or response to that question. But I don't know if at this time they've made a final decision on how the elections will be conducted. Thank you, Madam State. Our next question is, are people who are scheduled for jury duty excused due to the virus? Yes, uh, so right now, <laughs> um, uh, the, the public is not allowed to enter the courthouse. So those who have received notices for jury duty, uh, you will likely receive an updated notice at a later time, uh, rescheduling your jury duty service. Our next question, good morning, Aisha and staff. I have a college student, I'm assuming student, who has com who was committed what I understand to be some low level offense that has been under detention for several weeks despite being approved for release by a judge. His hearing has been delayed because of the virus impact on the court system. Just wanted to understand the criteria and the process for releasing individuals. Thank you guys for the outstanding services that you provide. 
Thank you, thank you. Now, uh, so so uh, I think Denise, if you can uh, ensure that that individual has uh, Miss Danso's email address, the the the, folk, the person who asked the question has Miss Danso's email address, so that she can uh, uh, look up that uh, particular inmate. But what I will say is, uh, if uh, a judge has ordered an individual uh, to be released, that the jail is making provisions to release those individuals. Uh, as was noted, uh, there are um, a few now, I think about 10 cases of um, inmates that have coronavirus, uh, as well as um, some staff members. So if the individual um, has a virus, uh, the coronavirus, then unless they are they are able to be released safely, they are uh, unable to release them. But I don't know if that's your situation. Um, uh, but we will look. Uh, we will be happy to look up uh, your particular uh, your, your son. Uh, but again, if a judge has ordered release, then that means that they've already had a bond hearing. We likely, if it was a low-level offense, we were likely likely consented to the release. Um, but there must be something else going on if that individual has not yet been released. But we would need to look into that. Our next question is: What is the safe capacity number of ADP? I I don't know what ADP is. Could, oh, average daily population. That's probably what uh, they're referring to um, because Ms. Danto in her, um, in her presentation talked about the average daily population in the jail. Um, so, uh, you know, really, ideally, um, I think uh, everyone understands that social isolation is the best way to prevent the coronavirus. So I think the jail would like uh, to get uh, the population at a level where each individual inmate has their own cell. Uh, at minimum, that's what they'd like to, to, to see. Uh, you, you'll probably hear reports that our jail is half full, which is true, because I think our jail capacity is about 1,500 or so, and right now, uh, the census is uh, just under 600. But unfortunately, the jail, the jail isn't completely open. So there are units of the jail that have been closed and have been closed for some time. And so there are still inmates that uh, have uh, at least two, two occupants uh, in a cell. And obviously that is not best practices. And so we have been working uh, really uh, very collaboratively with the public defender's office and with the uh, jail uh, to really review those inmates who we believe won't pose a threat to our community and can be released safely. Ultimately, the decision is up to a judge. So we might, we'll, we will make a recommendation and generally uh, judges have uh, gone along with our recommendations, but there have been occasions when uh, the judge did not uh, uh, support our recommendation and we respect uh, their uh, discretion and uh, you know and, and how they evaluated the inmate um, so I don't really it's, it's hard to talk about firm numbers the only reason I say that is because there are people who are in jail right now who have committed very serious offenses who are a threat to their victims threat to the general community and potentially a threat to themselves. Uh, so we can't just release someone because we're trying to reach a number. We have to do it responsibly uh, because the last thing we want is to release someone because we're trying to get down to a number and then that person commits an offense or threatens a witness or a victim in their case. So we have to um, exercise uh, a lot of judgment um, in, in terms of making these recommendations. All I can tell you is that we are reviewing them daily so that we can make the best recommendations. And uh, we still believe that there are individuals who can be safely released 
that are that are currently uh, inmates at our jail. And so as we review those and, and uh, the public defender or private counsel uh, request a bond hearing, we will be uh, consenting to certain certain individuals being released release, excuse me. But I, I have to say that the safety of our victims, our witnesses, our general community is number one. That has to be number one. Um, but we also recognize that we have responsibility to those housed in our jail as well. And that's why we started this program to make sure that uh, we show our care, concern, and compassion for those who've been accused of crimes or who are serving out sentences because of crimes that they were convicted of. Um, but we're doing our best to reduce the jail population. Uh, we think that uh, we've done a good job of that, but we continue uh, to review cases and make recommendations. Our next question is, are U visa requests for non-documented witnesses still being processed for those who have been or will be a witness to a crime? Yes, the U visas are still being processed. Okay, our next question. An inmate has been ordered home detention by the judge. He is being held in the detention center without cause. He had an emergency hearing scheduled at the height of the pandemic. He is currently held in a unit with a high number of people are falling ill. His cellmate was taken out for a couple of days and then returned to their unit to his cell. Please advise us how are we able to get his case as access being he, being that he is 56 years of age and he is being impacted by this pandemic in the facility he is housed in. Mm -hmm. Well, without knowing the specific charges um, uh, that he's facing, um, I can't give you, you know, a I, I, don't, I don't know if I can tell you what our position would be. So we would, we would need additional information. Uh, so again, if you can provide um, the person who asked that question with Ms. Danso's uh, email address, uh, we're happy to review uh, that particular case and determine uh, what we believe would be appropriate. Okay, our next, oh, uh, can I get the number for the Family Justice Center again? Uh, yes. That number is 301-780-8008. We also have a website that I would direct you to as well, and that is princegeorgescourts.org backslash 358. Um, and before you ask the next, next uh, question, uh, Denise, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge a few other uh, staff members that we have that are work everyone's working hard, but we do have um, some staff members uh, who have been a part of our Operation Safe Release as, as well as working really hard with our victims. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge Tom O'Gorman, who also has uh, worked on the um, Safe Release program. Um, in addition to that, while I think overall uh, crimes are down, there are certain uh, categories of crimes that unfortunately, um, you know, we're seeing still uh, occur during this time. And so I really wanted to uh, thank uh, my uh, homicide unit. Um, uh, unfortunately, we've had, I think, about six or seven homicides during um, the pandemic period. Some of them have been back to back. And so um, those individuals who uh, try our homicide cases have to really get involved very early in the process and uh, work very collaboratively with our police department. So I wanna acknowledge the police department as well as our homicide unit and our special victims and family violence unit. Uh, again, as was mentioned, uh, family violence uh, is is a big concern, especially during a pandemic. And so we, ha you know, uh, consistently get, um, you know, cases in that we're evaluating and uh, and working hard to ensure that we're protecting our victims. Um, 
and, and again, our victim witness unit. And I know Ms. Middleton's on the, on the line and she's working 24 seven and her unit um, doesn't really stop because when we do hold these bond hearings, uh, we do so responsibly and we uh, make several attempts to reach out to our victims so that they can be a part of the bond hearing if they choose to, or they can um, give us you know, information or their position uh, so that we can articulate what the position of the victims are. So I have to say, I really appreciate every single unit, but I did want to highlight a few units that have really been working over time because of the nature of the issues that they deal with. Oh, and sorry, um, Alana Gale and Mary Grace that uh, and Jade um, Mathis who work on our um, problem solving courts and our mental health courts, because again, we want to ensure that individuals who commit offenses but have underlying issues are um, directed uh, to the appropriate resources, even at this time, even if it's virtual, uh, we want to make sure that we're not uh, missing people who need our help. So I just wanted to thank all of those individuals as well as the entire office. <laughs> okay, thank you. Our next question is, are individuals in drug court still being required to attend treatment? So I, you know, I, I'll get back to you on that. My understanding is that uh, to the extent that they can get virtual treatments, they are getting tr their treatments. My understanding, however, is that the only thing that's not occurring at this time for those individuals who are part of drug court is the actual drug test. So my understanding is that uh, that the, that the uh, drug court program is still you know, happening. I know it's happening virtually. I know my um, prosecutors are participating in it. My understanding is that the providers are still pro making provisions. So they're still providing. I believe they're doing it virtually. Um, however, uh, drug testing is not occurring at this time. Um, but we can um, answer that more fully. Um, we can get, because that, you know, that program was really handled by uh, the courts. And so, you know, we participate in the hearings, but after that, um, you know, our participation is somewhat limited. Uh, so we'll try to get a, a fuller answer to that. But yes, uh, drug court is still operating. Uh, Madam State's Attorney, if I could just supplement your response on behalf yes. of Lana. Um, yeah, the, that is correct. The entire uh, problem solving team is working remotely. Um, the case managers are, you know, in constant contact with their clients on a regular basis. And I know that the drug court staff is also in touch with um, some of the participants every day. Um, and as you mentioned, um, the treatment providers are working with the participants either by phone or a uh, video session. And so they, the, the participants certainly are, acting, are um, in a position to access services uh, remotely. So that is correct. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And again, we'll just get um, information from the drug court that we can uh, provide uh, to um, all of you um, after, after this session. So thank you for that question. Okay, I have a good morning, State's Attorney Braveway, along with staff and all presenters. Thank you for conducting this town hall from Reverend John E. Richardson. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Reverend Richardson. <laughs> um, also, we have a uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Why are, are you limiting releases only for low-level inmates? Why not those that have served lengthy sentences and pose no threat to society? Yeah, we, as, as I mentioned, we also are um, reviewing those who have uh, sent, have served uh, sentences and they're nearing the end of their sentence. So um, whether they're 30, 60, 90 days, maybe even up to 120, depending on the type of offense, we are making recommendations. And again, these are just our recommendations. We ultimately cannot release anyone. They have to be released by the order of a court. So we are um, making those recommendations. We have made those recommendations and people have been released who are actually serving sentences in our jail. We are also making recommendations at the state level, but we have less control and less influence at that level. But we are working collaboratively with the public defender's office and I believe we are the first jurisdiction uh, that made 
recommendations for the uh, release of state prisoners. But again, that's gonna uh, be up to the governor uh, and, and the parole board. And, uh, you know, so, so we, again, we will make our recommendations. We have done that, uh, but it, it's, we can't order their, the, them released, but we do support the release of a number of individuals who are serving sentences. Okay, uh, same, uh, same attendee uh, wants to know is, uh, who is there, well, she says there's, is there talk of releasing those who have medical conditions that can put them as risk, at risk as well? Yes, we, we requested um, a list of those individuals or to, I mean, we, because of HIPAA, we can't actually, we, we don't know what their special conditions are, but we did want to know like who, who uh, at the jail uh, may be more at risk. And so we were able to get that information. Um, and so we've been uh, reviewing all of those individuals. Again, some people who may have medical conditions have committed very serious offenses. So if they've committed uh, a first degree or second degree murder, if they have raped someone, um, I mean, we have to think about the safety of the community as well. And so we can't just release someone just because uh, they uh, have a medical condition. However, we will evaluate individuals who have medical conditions, uh, who may have committed uh, offense that we may consider serious, but we may believe at this time that they can be safely released to, to, uh, to the community, um, potentially on a heightened monitoring system like our electronic monitoring or something like that. So we are evaluating for those purposes, but there are people who are in our jail who have committed very serious offenses who may have underlying medical issues. And again, we have to be responsible. We can't just release people because they have a medical condition if, they, uh, if we believe they will pose a threat to our community. Um, but, but we are looking at those individuals and making recommendations as well. Okay, next question. Can we make sure that pretrial detainees receive a ballot for the upcoming primary? How will the process work to ensure they receive a ballot and that it is sent back to the Board of Elections? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really great question. Um, we can um, make that inquiry uh, to the Board of Elections. Um, and that would have to be uh, a coordinated effort between the Board of Elections and uh, our local Department of Corrections and also uh, corrections uh, and prisons across the, well, really corrections, I guess, for the most part, uh, corrections across the state. So that's something that um, we can certainly recommend that they uh, do. Um, I just don't know if the Board of Elections has yet worked out their process uh, completely. And that's something that um, I think an earlier questioner asked about the election process. So that's something that we're going to have to inquire with the Board of Elections about. But I, I do believe that we should promote um, access to the ballot by everyone. And we certainly should, um, you know, encourage people uh, who are eligible to vote to vote. And so I'm in total agreement that uh, we, we should be able to do all that we can to ensure that those individuals that are coming out, whether it's pre-trial or they're, uh, they've served their sentence or being released early, uh, know that they are eligible to vote and have access to the ballot. Um, the next question is, is this safe release uh, program for detention, uh, for detention centers only? Well, I mean, right now, I mean, yeah, I mean, when you say detention centers only, so it is, it's for our um, uh, Department uh, of Corrections, our County Department of Corrections, um, and we are also working on our uh, juveniles being held at Sheltonham. So those are the, the two that uh, we, we are focused on because that's where we have the most influence. And again, we have uh, made recommendations uh, for individuals who are sentenced to our state prison. Uh, but again, we have less influence there, but we have made uh, our recommendations uh, to the governor and, uh, and to the parole board. So we've, we've done uh, as much as we can do at this time uh, for those who are 
housed in our state prison, uh, but where we have a little bit more influence is with our county, um, local county uh, detention center uh, at the Department of Corrections in Upper Marlboro. And also we're working really closely with the Department of Juvenile Services and the Public Defender's Office to assist our uh, juveniles who can be released safely into the community. Um, next question. Thank you and your team for your hard work. And I personally had someone go in on a false allegation and was quickly released due to your innovative efforts. How long will this last? If the governor changes his order, would this change? Are the released detainees tested before they leave so as not to affect the general population? Okay, so that's, those are really good questions. And I figured I'd get a question about this. So I did uh, talk with our uh, director of uh, the Department of Corrections yesterday about the safety measures that they're taking uh, at the jail. So let me just say this first. Um, this project uh, that I asked my chief of staff to really spearhead for the office, uh, I think, you know, when, when you're in crisis situations and you are looking at innovative ways to make your community safe, I think what you recognize is that there are some best practices that you develop at that time that you will want to carry into sort of when, when life turns back to normal. Um, and I think that our, uh, our safe release program is something that we will continue uh, to do throughout, not just uh, the rest of the pandemic, but even after the pandemic. Because again, right now we're dealing with the coronavirus, but there are always health issues at our jail. And so if there are individuals who can be safely released into, a, into the community on some pretrial release level um, or on their own personal recognizance, uh, I think we're going to really focus on, on that. And we've developed a really great relationship with um, the uh, 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 pretrial services a unit within the Department of Corrections. And so we are really working collaboratively with them. So I, I, you will see this uh, program uh, continue on. Uh, now with respect to um, individuals who are being released. Now I recognize when an individual's ordered release or if uh, they, let's say a commissioner uh, releases them or they're issued a bond and they make bail, um, that would be, you know, prior to them going into a bond review where we would um, make recommendations at that time. Um, those individuals may have been committed to the facility, let's say overnight, and then they're released the next day. Uh, what's happening now is that the jail is uh, taking the temperature of um, all of their inmates daily. Um, for those who are being released, uh, they are providing them with um, information on how to be safe. Um, but the same dangers uh, that uh, exist in our normal community exist in the jail. So they don't have the ability to test every single person uh, at the jail. The same protocols in place for testing the general population is how they're testing in the jail because they don't have an unlimited number of uh, coronavirus test. Uh, so they are testing those who have um, extreme symptoms. Uh, they're identifying those individuals, isolating them to the medical unit. And um, so the 10 individuals uh, that um, uh, uh, Ms. Danso mentioned earlier, that all of those individuals are in zero pressure cells in the medical unit. Um, and those who were in their housing units that may have been um, exposed to the coronavirus are being monitored daily. All of the um, inmates have masks uh, that have been provided uh, by the jail. All of the jail staff have um, M95 masks. So um, they're doing their best to control, um, you know, uh, the spread of the virus in the jail. Um, but they don't have the ability to test every single person. Um, but again, I think the jail is just like our normal, like uh, going to the store. There's always going to be risks because uh, of the way that this uh, virus is spread. Uh, but the jail is doing all that they can to ensure that they're not releasing people who uh, have uh, 
tested positive for coronavirus if they don't have a place where they can safely go and quarantine. And I know at least in one uh, case where a person was um, ordered released, uh, but they um, tested positive for coronavirus and the place where they were planning to go uh, did not want to receive them because they're of course concerned about the spread uh, that individual, they're, they're working to, to determine whether or not there's alternatives for them to be released, but it is, um, it is difficult. Uh, they're in a difficult situation. Again, they don't have unlimited tests, but they're doing all that they can uh, to protect people inside the jail and for those who are being released to give them the appropriate um, counseling before they're released. Okay. All right, our next question. Oh, can you please provide the contact number to, uh, to, for an intake specialist for domestic violence? Again, please. Okay, all right, that is the same number, 301-780-8008. There have been so many re-offenders being released when will someone look at the inmates who committed a first offense and never re-offended? Well, we're first time offenders, if they have, um, depending on the nature of their charges, uh, you know, they're being released too. So it's not just, in fact, a lot of the folks who've been released are first time offenders. There are some who have, uh, you know, multiple offenses. A lot of those who have multiple offenses are relatively minor offenses. Um, so uh, an individual could have a multiple, multiple uh, you know, trespassing offenses or a, a, a petty theft offenses. Um, so we're considering everyone. Um, but again, it, 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 we have to look at the nature of the offense uh, for which they were charged and their ability to be safely released uh, to the community. Okay. Oh, here's an, a good question. Will you, oh, well. How has the 2020 census impacted your efforts? And I think this will be our last question. Okay. Well, the, the 2020 census um, hasn't really impacted our efforts. What we really want people to do is respond to the census. <laughs> I know our county executive has really stressed the importance for Prince George's, Prince George's, excuse me, to stand up and be counted. And we really need everyone, everyone uh, to respond to the census. So if you can do a, uh, our county a huge favor would be to post about responding to the sentence on social, um, census, excuse me, on social media. If you can call your friends, your family members, send emails, do all that you can to encourage people to respond to the census. This is extremely important because in the future, um, it will determine how much money our jurisdiction will get, um, which will determine how how much we can afford in terms of services to our community, as well as infrastructure for our community. We must all, we must all do our part to ensure that every single person in our county is counted. I think our population has probably grown significantly over the past 10 years, but the only way uh, that, that, uh, that uh, growth will be documented is if we do our part to respond to the census. So please, I think at the, the last uh, time, uh, I think the county executive talked about this, I think we were uh, in the bottom two in terms of responses to the census. And that's really not good enough uh, for Prince George's County. We have to do better. So I just ask all of you to respond to the census, to post about it, talk about it, and ensure that all of your uh, friends, relatives, co-workers uh, are, are responding to the census. Okay, at this time, I would like to thank Ms. Brave Boy 
our other presenters and everyone who helped in making this event possible. Please do not forget to follow State's Attorney Brave Boy on social media at PGSAO News, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. If you have any question that you would like to ask of any of our presenters, please email Thelmetria Michaelitis at TA Michaelitis, let me spell the last name for you, M I C H A E L I D E S at C O dot P G dot M D dot U S. Please stay safe and take care of one another. That concludes our community in the courthouse virtual meeting.